everybody. I'm Aaron Simmons. This is Philosophy for Where We Find Ourselves, January 29, 2024. I have some exciting news. I'm sitting here in front of my home studio where I have just finished recording the audible version of Camping with Kierkegaard. It is off now at the studio, getting mastered and produced, and so hopefully will be available for everybody in the next few weeks. Make sure that you are subscribed here at YouTube and also over on my Substack, Philosophy in the Wild, because that's where I'm going to be distributing information, really doing a kind of relaunch of the text now in this new Audible form. So make sure that you are subscribed in both places so you don't miss out on any of it. All right, today's video is going to be thinking through an essay called The Fixation of Belief. It's written by an American pragmatic philosopher named Charles Sanders Peirce. Why I think this essay is so interesting and helpful today is we live in a society where it is increasingly the case that misinformation, disinformation, they're rampant. And so we're often even told that we live in a post-truth world. Well, that's a disaster, right? If we live without a concern for truth, well, what then fills that vacuum? What fills that void? And the answer is it's going to be power. This is, in fact, a mode that we can necessarily derive from what Aaron James calls an asshole culture and what Harry Frankfurt calls the increased amount of bullshit, which happens in a space where people are expected to hold views on things that they don't understand. So we should be better at holding our views, we should be better at articulating our beliefs, and we should be better at engaging others with whom we disagree in the name of caring about truth instead of just caring about political or social expediency. I think Peirce actually is really helpful in this front because in the essay he talks about four different strategies for how we fix belief. Now, fixing belief here, he's got two ideas in mind, and I think this is pretty cool. On the one hand, we are fixing falsehoods. How do we fix our beliefs that actually should be rejected such that we move more into a better sense of epistemic life? where we now have fixed our beliefs because we love truth more than just being perceived as correct. So in that sense of, you know, getting our beliefs made better as we make ourselves better epistemic agents is the first sense. But the second sense is when we understand that we hold beliefs and they need fixed in the sense of made stronger, made better, made more justified, made more supported, we also understand that they then get stabilized in the right way. So one of the problems I think we face in our culture right now with the rise of political division, of political power play, the, the dismissiveness that we have towards people with whom we disagree as either being irrational or immoral in almost immediate ways. The problem with this is it creates a situation where our beliefs become unchallenged. And therefore, they are made stable, but they're made stable for horrible reasons. Namely, we just live in echo chambers. If no one ever challenges or critiques or interrogates the beliefs we hold, and we keep holding those beliefs because now we just hang out with people who reinforce them, we've not done the right sort of work to make our belief and ourselves better. And therefore, the stability of our belief is actually not only illusory, but a revelation of epistemic and moral vice. So how do we get better at this? How do we fix our belief? Well, I think Peirce is helpful because what he does is he says, look, we find ourselves living in a world where doubt is real. We hold views and yet we run into things in our experience that gives us pause about the views that we hold. And he says that doubt is good because it leads us into what he terms inquiry. Inquiry being the thoughtful, reflective attempt to overcome that doubt by stabilizing our belief with a concern for truth, with the best reasons. So how do we then do this? And he says there's four strategies, three have some big problems, and one he thinks is really promising. The first strategy, he says, is we simply engage in the method of tenacity. This is sometimes called foot stomping, right? Or the ostrich who buries its head under the ground. This is, in fact, where we 
respond to objections and critique and doubt just by shouting it down. We just continue to affirm and think by repeating something enough times, surely we will make it true. But no matter how many times you say two plus two equals five, your bridges are going to fall down, right? So tenacity is disastrous because it has no concern for truth and instead is grounded only exclusively in a desire to protect ourselves from the hard work of owning up to the humility required when it comes to being a responsible epistemic person. Now, tenacity, I would suggest, is one of the most common modes that we see in our world today. This is where we simply reinforce ourselves by hanging out with people who repeat the things we already think. And by hearing them repeat it, we think that somehow this makes it true. Echo chamber phenomena is a kind of tenacity methodology. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that it has no concern for truth. It has no concern for actually getting better. And so eventually it breaks down because we can't live in our echo chamber forever. So then he says we move into a different kind of methodology, which he labels authority, the method of authority. And he says that this is what often happens in the context of churches and theological frames. And that seems right to me. There are epistemic authorities that operate in different discursive communities, like the church, like religious practice, where we find ourselves saying, well, these are the people who are positioned to tell me what is true in relation to these particular questions. The problem with this is we can choose very bad authorities. Authorities who aren't relevant to the thing at hand. It's one thing to say I'm appealing to an authority in the medical field because they've got all of these credentials and have continually proven themselves an expert. Instead, saying, oh, I'll just appeal to my favorite YouTuber to tell me, in fact, how to live my life and what nutrition looks like and what shots I should take. That's a disastrous appeal to authority because it's not grounded in an appropriate awareness of what makes somebody good at what they claim to know. So the problem with appeals to authority is not that they are always bad. It's that when we misapply them, we find ourselves submitting to real foolish talk and thinking that it's in fact smart. The problem with the method of authority is that it tends to foster a diminution of our own epistemic trustworthiness. Right? We end up just abdicating the work we should do onto someone else. Now, again, this is an important virtuous move when we are doing it in the right ways. But we tend to do it in all the wrong ways because somebody who's popular on Twitter or somebody who's blowing up on TikTok or has a lot of Instagram followers must be right about things. And that's where we get ourselves in all kinds of trouble. Alternatively, it's where then the power structure of a particular institution shuts down critical inquiry, which happens, I think, in a lot of religious contexts, where then questions are met as a refusal to be part of the community rather than applauded as actually helping the community be better. So we move on to the third option. And this one he calls the a priori method. That's a complicated philosophical notion for we simply abide by our instincts. We go with our gut. And this is something that, again, has lots of benefit in certain restricted ways, but it can go very, very badly when we start thinking that I know more than the legitimate epistemic authorities in a particular area. I think going with your gut, this kind of a priori model, actually plays out in our context as the phrase, do your own research. The problem is you've got to be actually trained to do research in the right ways. In other words, it takes real work not to misunderstand and manipulate your own intuitions about things. So I recognize that as a philosopher, I can do philosophical research. I recognize that when it comes to things like the economy or things like international relations, I need to recognize my limitations. So doing my research means consulting the people who really know how to research in that field. So going with your gut, 
Again, there are spaces where this is important, but it has led to a social context where we far too often think that we are the only experts and we have abandoned any social structure and context by which expertise is legitimate in shared ways. So what do we do? All three of these, tenacity, authority, and the a priori or go with your gut method, all of these run into real serious problems when it comes to social policy, when it comes to shared epistemic life, when it comes to us helping each other as self-governing members of a democratic society. And so Peirce says that the best method is what he calls scientific investigation. Now, I think that's the wrong phrasing because that makes us give even further in to a kind of scientistic idolatry that says if it can't be phrased in repeatable experimental methods conducted in cold objectivity, then it's not really worth much. I think that's entirely misguided. It misses out on the affective dimension of human existence, on the moral and social aspects of what it looks like to inhabit the human condition, and the many, many ways in which truth shows up for embodied, felt beings like us. But what he's getting at, I think, is right. And that's simply the notion that there really are facts about the world. There are facts about states of affairs. There really are things against which we have to move. We have to change our views in light of which we have to revise our conceptions. When we continue to hear something repeated over and over and over and over, for example, Trump's lies about the stolen 2020 election, we either give in to tenacity, well, he wouldn't say it so many times if it weren't true, right, which is utter bullshit in a technical sense, or we give in to authority, well, he knows what he's talking about, he's really rich, but that's an inappropriate and irrelevant fact when it comes to things like election policy and social data, or we go with our gut and we say, ah, he's fighting for me, so I'm on his side. Notice all three of these are misguided models for how to make sense of and assess the claim that's being put forth. If we instead appeal to scientific investigation, a better way of understanding this would just be we appeal to the evidence that is actually made in publicly accessible ways so that we can recognize there is a fact of the matter and the fact of the matter is something that can be shareable and supported with evidence. The evidence continues to undermine his claim and not only that, the evidence has continued to be found substantive in court case after court case after court case. So again, this isn't a critique of conservative politics. It's trying to get us to be better as responsible members of a democracy. And when we do this, we realize that evidence matters. Arguments make a difference. You can't just say stuff and get away with it. We have to hold each other's feet to the fire in order to encourage each other to go deeper, to build and, and establish a society that's actually grounded on the ideal of self-governing people. But we can't be self-governing, right? Unless we are deeply invested in seeing each other as responsible and trustworthy epistemic agents. But we're not practicing that very well right now, right? If we go too far by saying, oh, well, that's wrong because my conservative neighbor said it, we're ignoring the fact that that person might actually have a really good argument for the view. Now, if it's for the stolen election, then that argument actually no longer needs heard because it's already been heard repeatedly over and over, over and over. So we can be irresponsible when we are giving our attention and our time to views that have been roundly shown no longer to need responsible attention. We are distracted by misinformation when we think that certain things demand our attention, when in fact they demand that we respond by saying, this has already been decided. Now, Notice, not here decided in the sense of an appeal to an authority that abandons my own epistemic uh, rights and my own epistemic responsibilities, but instead it's been decided precisely by the workings of responsible social epistemic agents. We considered this. 
We made sense of this. We worked this through. Now let's move on. We don't need to go back and rehash questions about racism. It's evil. We've thought this through. This has already been argued. So we don't have to then entertain the views of the white supremacist in order to say that we are being responsible and listening to all perspectives. Instead, we've got to hold that person's feet to the fire when it comes to saying, hey, I expect more of you. I see you as a epistemic equal, and so I'm going to expect that you step up your game and not keep trying to pull the conversation in directions that derail it, that force it to be distracted from what really matters. What does this all get us? The, the idea here is, A, fixing beliefs hard work. It takes time. It's not something that is done exceptionally easily. Right? It's something that requires that we dig and that we develop humility and that we show hospitality to others. But it also means that our views are not fixed just because of influencers. Our views are fixed because the arguments support standing there. But it's also really important to realize that when we cultivate humility, we will see that standing somewhere means there are other places we could stand. And there's other places we could stand may have some argumentative support as well. That's when the inquiry must continue. Peirce had this other idea where he says that ultimately truth is the end of inquiry in the sense of its goal, its telos, its trajectory, but also in the sense that truth is what carries the day when doubt and questions and inquiry no longer continue. So the goal is to Keep asking questions so long as it is reasonable to do so in light of the evidence that is available. But when the evidence is no longer there and we're now just trying to stick to our particular commitment, we're now epistemically irresponsible and we should be socially scorned for abandoning the fundamental reasoned commitments of deliberative democratic societies. So it's hard work. But man, the stakes are high. The stakes are high. I said uh, back when Trump was first elected that I was horrified by the fact that they lied. The first move, right, was to lie about the crowd size. Not because he lied, politicians often do, but because what he was expecting of the audience was pay no attention to evidence, just listen to me. I will decide as authority what counts as evidence for you. And again, were he a legitimate epistemic authority in a particular sphere, then that's not immediately a problem. But when his claim is, trust me, simply because I am wealthy and powerful and now have status, this is actively a erasure of the epistemic stakes of democratic life. We must and we can do better. Not do better than a particular political vision, but do better than allowing this nonsense to carry the day internal to deliberative democratic engagement. Reasons matter. Critique needs welcomed. Self-humility is something required in order to model hospitality. Fixing our beliefs means fixing our social structures to support truth as the goal of inquiry. Purse is a remarkable resource for this task. And so I encourage you today to take a look at his work, to think about these different strategies, and to ask yourself seriously, man, do I give in to the go with my gut in problematic ways? Do I really just become tenacious in the fact that I want to foot stomp and just not listen to others? Do I appeal to authorities that make no sense? Or do I care about doing the hard work of paying attention to evidence, revising my views in light of the facts of a matter, and really seeking out the right kinds of conversation partners in order to encourage me ever more toward truth, goodness, beauty, and a society that is wedded to self-governing individuals as reason-giving individuals. I hope this is helpful. Again, subscribe here at YouTube. Hop on over to Substack. Get subscribed there. 
This was a longer video. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is the basically uh, one video a month I'm doing in a longer form since I'm no longer doing the exclusive video content for subscribers to my newsletter. I've instead kind of remodeled that. And so I'm doing a variety of other exclusive things for paid subscribers over on Substack. But here on YouTube, once a month, there will be a longer form video that really tries to unpack a, a idea in a little bit more detail. I hope you enjoy that. Please give me some feedback, drop comments, Let's talk together and find our ways to the trails, both in the mountains and also help ourselves navigate the trails here in life. Thanks again, as always, for watching. I'll see you next time, unless a piano falls on our heads.